And the kernel of the alpha is one dimensional. And this condition alpha watch the alpha non zero means that these are transverse at every point. Uh, and we call the kernel of alpha the context structure, that it's psi. And to alpha, we can associate a vector field that is defined by being in the line direction defined by the alpha, by the kernel of the alpha, and normalize such that alpha evaluated on the vector field is equal to one. Okay, so this is, there's a very important difference in this talk between context forms and context structures. And the reason is because I'm interested in red vector fields. And so if you have a context structure, you can get, you have many context forms that define it. Because you can take one context form, whose kernel is your context structure, and then you multiply by any positive or any non-zero function, and you get another one form that defines the same context structure because the kernel hasn't changed, but the red vector field changes drastically, and not only in size, but in direction. Okay, we change in size, in size only if f is constant. Okay. So we, we're talking about contact forms or red vector fields, not really about contact structures today. Uh, please stop me if you have any questions. Now, let me talk about... See, I have a question already. Yes. So what, what happens is that when you multiply by F and it's not constant, then the D alpha adds a twisting term. Is that right? Exactly. You get DF, which alpha plus F D alpha. And so does that break up closed orbits? There will always be closed orbits, but the dynamics completely different. I mean, you you don't have nothing to compare between the two of us. Okay, I mean, okay, red okay. vector fields are all the transfer. I mean, you can look at the all the vector fields that preserve the plane field. All those are always transferred to this are red vector fields. You can always find a, a form okay. that will make it red. Oh, okay, thanks. Okay, so you have many, many, many grab vector fields for a given context structure. Okay. So now let me talk about sections. So I put it between parentheses because I'm going to start with a section, real section and not a Birkhoff section. So if you have a three-dimensional flow, a section without fixed points, a section for me is going to be a closed surface that is transverse to the vector field and intersects all the orbits. Okay, if you have such an object, you have a well-defined return map on, on the surface. And so this return map, from this return map, you can build a vibration over the circle where the fibers are basically the surface. So obviously such an object, I mean, for a vector field to have a section is a very restrictive thing because the f one thing that you're asking is that th three manifold fibers over the circle and this doesn't happen for all manifolds okay but it's also very restrictive on the dynamics so there is a much general situation that's called Birkhoff sections that were I think first appear in the work of Poincaré in uh, celestial mechanics. I will talk about it in the next slide. And then Birkhoff built them for, for many geodesic flows. And what it is, is you, you allow yourself to have boundary. So basically you want to find a collection of periodic orbits of the vector field so that in the complement of this periodic orbit, you get this vibration over the circle. So you get a surface that is that has boundary. The boundary is made of periodic orbits. The interior is embedded and transverse to the vector field. I won't ask the boundary to be embedded. 
okay, because I won't get it in my theorems. So I would just ask the boundary to be immersed. This means that you can have several boundary components of the surface that are mapped into the same periodic orbits, or you can have one component that covers several times one of the periodic orbits. And then you ask that the surface intersects all orbits in finite time. If, and there is there will be a technical condition that I will briefly introduce, but it's a very, I mean, it's just a technical condition that allows us to, allows us to do some things and you almost always have it, is this condition that we introduced is called delta strung, and it's a condition on the boundary orbits. So you can look at the boundary orbits and blow them up. So when you blow up a periodic orbit, you get from M a manifold that has a boundary component, there is a two torus, and the vector field is a finite interior and extends smoothly to this boundary torus, and it's basically the differential of the flow, what you get on the boundary. And also, if you have a if you have a Birkhoff section, the Birkhoff section will give you in this new in this boundary torus will give you a collection of closed curves. So you want these closed curves to still be transverse to the vector field and form a section, a real section, to the vector field restricted to the boundary torus. Okay. If you don't get this last part, it's really not important. Um, I want to make a few remarks, and I will start combining rep, rep vector fields and Birkhoff sections. Rep vector fields cannot have sections, so sections without boundary. And the reason is Stokes theorem. So if you have a surface that is transverse to the rep vector field, the contact form that defines it, alpha, when you get d alpha, it defines an area form on the section. This is an exact area form, so it has to integrate to positive, but then if the surface has no boundary by Stokes, you get a contradiction. So you don't have the first case among rem vector fields, but you do have a lot of Birkhoff sections. There is a lot of results, and I will explain you why this is a generic condition, actually. One thing you need to have Birkhoff sections is to have periodic orbits. Um, so this is known for rep vector fields in three dimensions. It was, so the existence of one periodic orbit was proved first by Hoffer uh, in certain three manifolds using pseudo-holomorphic curves then by tops in all three manifolds using silver, weight, and invariance. And then by Christopher Garden and Hutchings, they proved the existence of the second periodic orbit. It is conjecture that every red vector hill has two or infinitely many periodic orbits, and this is proof for many vector fields, and I will, many red vector fields, I will explain you. Maybe I will explain you at the end if I have time. Okay, so when you have a Birkhoff section, you get, as I said before, an open book decomposition. So if you look at the boundary of the sections, it gives you a link of periodic orbits, this K, and the complement will fiber over as one. And so I will call, I will use a lot, the names K is the binding of the open book, and the fibers are the pages. So the fibers are, each fiber is a Birkhoff section, okay? And it's called an open book because it's what happens to, an op to a book if you open it and you put, I mean, and you do what you don't want to put a book, uh, to do to a book that you like. I mean, you put the cover and the back of cover together. Um, when you have a Birkhoff section, you also get a map there is the first return map from the surface to the surface. You have to be careful about what happens in the boundary 
depending on the type of vector femur you have, the type of periodic orbits you have in the boundary, but you can get a diffeomorphism or a homeomorphism, depending on what you want to see. And this captures the dynamics of the vector film. So a, Bir a Birkhoff section allows you to go from a three-dimensional flow that is a rather complicated object normally, to the diffeomorphism or homeomorphism of a surface with boundary that is also a complicated object, but a priori simpler because you lost one dimension and then you have discrete time. Um, and here is one of the big difference between contact structures and contact forms. MNLG will prove a very powerful uh, relation between open book decompositions of a manifold and contact structures that's central in the study of contact structures. But I will just put here one part of it that is not the strongest part is that every contact structure is carried by an open book decomposition. It means that you can find a form, a contact form, that defines your contact structure whose rep, tangent, rep vector field is supported by this open book decomposition. And by that, I mean that it's tangent to the binding and transverse to the interior of the pages. So that each page will give you a Birkhoff section. We don't know if this is true for every rep vector field. I mean, I, I don't have any example. I don't know any example of a rep vector field that doesn't admit a Birkhoff section or is not carried by an open book decomposition. But who knows, it might exist. Okay, so so the, the question is, can, is every rep vector field supported by an open book decomposition or equivalently is does every rep vector field admit a Virchow section in dimension three? Okay, so let me give you a few examples of rep vector fields and what we know about Virchow sections. This is not an exhaustive list, it's far from being an exhaustive list, it's just a few examples. So Virchow section, as I told you, appear in the work of Poincaré on the restricted planar circular three-body problem. Let me try to explain you what this problem is. Um, so you have first two big bodies that you can think of the sun of the sun and the and the earth that move in a plane and they move in circles around the center of mass. So the, there's a line that connects both of them and you have a center of mass in the line and you suppose that they're moving on circles around this, this point. And then you have a third body that has mass equal to zero. So it means that won't affect the movement of these two big bodies, but it will be affected by the two big bodies by Newton's laws. And you want to describe the movement of the third body. And the movement is given by a Jacobian that is that depends on time. But then if you change uh, for a frame that is turning with, with the two big bodies, you get a, an autonomous Hamiltonian. And when you get an autonomous Hamiltonian from R4, so it's an autonomous Hamiltonian defined on R4, except at a couple of points, uh, the level sets are three dimensions, and so the regular level sets are three manifolds. And this Hamiltonian has five critical points that correspond to either three or four critical values. This was proved by Lagrange. It was proved recently that the Hamiltonian flow on a surface is Rep, so this means that it's the, up to reparameterization, a rep vector field, up to the first critical value, and even a little bit above the first critical value. And this is proved by Peter Alvos, who's Pur, Straubenfelder, Otto Van Koert, and Gabriel Patel in 2001. Okay, so in this problem, um, Poincare had found 
Birkhoff sections for very small values of, of the Hamiltonian by doing variational methods. And this was also done by Conley and McGeehy, I mean, among a long time. But it's still an open question in general, even for the red vector fields, to know if they have Birkhoff sections. Uh, Albers, Frauenfelder, Van Gord, and Hoffer also prove that under some relation between the masses, there, there are Birkhoff sections. But there are still a lot of levels we don't know if there are Birkhoff sections in this problem. Okay. Um, using the work of Poincaré, Birkhoff studied Birkhoff, uh, that's why we call them Birkhoff sections, so studied Birkhoff sections for geodesic flows. And he proved a, bunch, a lot of results that are very, very, very topological, I will say. So, for example, he proved, I think, I think the date here is not right. This 1920 is not right. I think it's 1919, but I, I, I had this doubt just a few months ago. So he proved, for example, if you have a sphere with positive curvature, there's always a Birkhoff section that is an annulus. So this was reproved like in mother language by Bangert in 93. He also proved that every hyperbolic surface, so if you put constant negative curvature, maybe just has negative curvature, it should work. Um, the, rep, the, the geodesic flow admits a Birkhoff section, that is actually a genus one Birkhoff section, and you, you can build it, I mean, it's just a draw. Um, and this technique by of Birkhoff was taken recently by Contreras, Nipper, Masukeli, and Schulz to build a lot of Birkhoff sections um, on surfaces of genus at least one that have no contractible geodesic without contribute points. I, I will tell you a little bit about Birkhoff strategy for the sphere in a moment, but I don't want to get into more details on this. Um, there's a very nice work of Fried, David Fried, where he proved that transitive and acid flows always have, Fried, always have Birkhoff sections. He has no control on the complexity of the sections. Maybe one can do better, but I don't know. Um, and recently, uh, Sang, that is a student of Ian Egel, constructed tra uh, Birkhoff sections for transitive pseudo flows on three manifolds using something that is called veering tri triangulations. Okay. Uh, and, and among rare vector fields, there are some results, especially about disk-like Birkhoff sanctions. Uh, Umberto Hinovitz has a lot of results on that. I won't cite them. Okay. So let me, I'm going to talk about a little bit of the technique that Fried used it here in another framework, because I'm going to use it at the end. So I will consider a very simple example, so you can think of the Hopf vibration and taking a, a vector field that is tangent to it. You can think that this is a double cover of the geodesic flow of the round two sphere. So if you have the Hopf vibration on S3, so here's a few fibers uh, drawn, each fiber is the boundary of an embedded disk, and this disk is a Birkhoff section. And you can ask yourself, what happens if I take two fibers, two periodic orbits of this flow. Do they bound a Birkhoff section? And if they do, what is the topology of this Birkhoff section? And what I want to tell you is that if you take any two periodic orbits, they bound a Birkhoff section that is an analog. And one way of building it is the following, and this is due to Fried. That's what he used for it for an also flows. You take the two disks and you can move them a little bit to make them transverse in the, along the intersection. So you have a 
a segment here in the intersection with two endpoints, one in each orbit, okay? And I want to undo the intersection by obtaining, and I want at the end I want to get a surface that's still transverse to the vector field in the interior, obviously not in the boundary. So along the interior, so without the two black dots, just along the line, there is just one thing you can do. So you have the intersection line, you have the direction of the flow that is now vertical, if you can see it transversely here. And if you want to undo these intersections, there's two things you can do. You can either join these two or the top ones and the bottom ones. And obviously just one of them gives you a transverse surface. So you do that, okay? And then you're happy for along the interior of this segment, but then you get to the boundary and then you have to picture that. And there, here's a picture. So you get to the boundary, here's one section, you have the intersection line over here. And when it gets to the point of intersection, the new section will just go around and continue down. And these two pictures are very nice, but the next one is not that nice. We haven't found a way to do it nicer. Um, what you get on the right figure is an annulus, okay? And this is basically the, the section that Birkus built. So if, I mean, I told you this, this flow, the half, I mean, tangent to half vibration, you can think is, you can think it as a geodesic flow with a two of the round two sphere where you go to the double cover because the geodesic flow of the round two sphere lives on the unitary tangent bundle of S2, that is RP3. And to get to a S3, you do a double cover. So on, if you now think on the bottom picture, so if you have a sphere, a round sphere, you know that all the geodesics are close great circles. And if you take one, it lifts to the unitary tangent bundles as two periodic orbits because it has two possible orientations. You can orient it this way or the other way, okay? So now you can build a section. So this is Birkhoff idea in the following way. So you know that all the orbits of the, of the geodesic flow, I mean, all the geodesics on the sphere will cross this equator at some point. So what Birkhoff says is, well, take for every point on the equator, take all the vectors, unitary vectors that point towards the North Hemisphere, which also, I mean, taking also the tangent ones to the, to the equator. This gives you an analysis, and it gives you an analysis because it's S1 times this interval. And the boundary is made of two periodic orbits, is the two periodic orbits of the, rep, of the geodesic flow that cover the equator. So if you choose well in the pictures above the two periodic orbits, what you get is exactly this Birkhoff annulus. It's called the Birkhoff annulus. And this technique works for every sphere with strictly positive curvature. Okay. So now let me tell you the theorem that I want to talk about today. I have no idea about the time. I don't know when I started. Um, sorry, I, I had one more thing. So you can, the thing I did with two periodic orbits, you can do it with arbitrary, with any number of periodic orbits, and you can also put like double one periodic orbit, and you can amuse yourself and compute the topology of the Birkhoff sections you get. We actually did it. Pierre and I in a paper. So so anyway, when you get more than two discs, you can have triple points in intersections, but you can also undo them. You just have to choose one order to undo it, and and it won't depend on the order you choose. Um, any questions so far? Okay. 
So here is the theorem. Um, so you take any closed through manifold with a context structure. And for that context structure, the set of contact forms such that the red vector field admits a Birkhoff section contains an open and dense set in this infinite topology. So as I said before, I don't know if there are red flows without Birkhoff section. So maybe this is true for every red flow. But for the moment, we don't have the techniques to prove such a thing. Okay. Before starting the proof, let me um, make a few comments. So more or less at the same time, this theorem was, I mean, the density part of this theorem was also proved by Contreras, Gonzalo Contreras and Marco Mazzucchelli. Um, the two proofs are based I mean, strongly based on the existence of broken book decompositions that I will talk in the next few slides. But the generic hypothesis is different than ours. Okay. Uh, Robert Cardona, that was a postdoc here last year, and I, we generalized this theorem and theorems that I will cite afterwards. Uh, for geodesical volume preserving vector fields. That was my subject of my PhD thesis. These are also known in dimension three as stable Hamiltonian structures. So this SAH, stable Hamiltonian structures, rep vector fields, and they also appear in levels of Hamiltonian vector fields. Um, in both, I mean, in Contreras and Masukali and in our theorem, not all, but most of the periodic orbits in the boundary of the Birkhoff section will be non-degenerate. So let me tell you what a non-degenerate periodic orbit is. So when you have a periodic orbit, you can consider the Poincaré map, so you take a small transversal and you consider the return map to this small transversal that is defining a very small, I mean, to a very small transversal, and you you have a a map from an open set, a two-dimensional open set into itself that preserves area. You can take the differential of it at the fixed point that corresponds to the periodic orbit, and you can look at the eigenvalues of this um, of this differential, I mean, the differential of the map. And non-degenerate asks for the eigenvalues to be different from one. Oh, so it's different from one for every iteration of the map. So when you suppose that a periodic orbit is non-degenerate, you have in, in dimension three, you have two possibilities. First is that the eigenvalues are complex, and so if you want, if you want, so it, so the differential makes a rotation transversely, and if you want them to be different from one for every iteration, you need to be an irrational rotation. And the other case is when there are uh, real eigenvalues, and then you have hyperbolic periodic orbits with a stable and unstable manifold. And this can and the hyperbolic orbits are will separate it in two between positive where the eigenvalues are positive and negative when the eigenvalues are negative. Okay. Any questions on the theorem? None so far. None so far. Okay. So let me explain to you the two main ingredients. Can I ask a question? I just appeared again. Yes, ask a question, Steve. If I have these eigenvalues can, and it's complex, that means I'm rotating it. Yeah. Can I rotate it either direction? Yes. And is this left-handed versus right-handed? No, I'm okay. not talking about. So I, I, we don't have any compatibility of orientations of the boundary with the interior of the surface. So you can turn in basically how you want. It doesn't make any. It doesn't make a difference in understanding. No, not really. Okay. Okay. 
having a Birkhoff section is a much weaker thing than being right-handed. Okay, right-handed means that every collection will bound a Birkhoff section. You just just need one collection that bounds. Okay. Okay, so let me give you the two main ingredients in the theorem, in the proof of the theorem, there are two big theorems. So the first one is 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 a theorem by Iri, Irie, I don't know how to pronounce it, uh, that was published in 21, and that it says that if you have a contact manifold, the set of ref vector fields with whose periodic orbits are equidistributed is equidistributed is infinitely generic okay so um this means so what what i mean by equidistribution is that if you can have that you can find i mean bigger and bigger collections of periodic orbits that you will put weights on them and such that when you take the measure, the invariant measure for the flow that is supported on this periodic orbits, it tends to the volume frame. Okay, I, I won't say anything more about this theorem, but we will use it at some point in the proof. And the other theorem is a theorem we proved by Vincent Collin, Pierre de Renoir, and I um, two or three years ago, but it was published this year was actually published like a month ago, is that if you have a non-degenerate red vector field, so here we are assuming that every periodic orbit is non-degenerate, then it is carried by a broken book decomposition. So this is the broken books I mentioned in the previous slide. So both the theorem I'm going to tell you about today, about generic existence of Virchow section, by us and by Marco Mazzucchelli and Gonzalo Contreras, they are both based on broken book decompositions. Uh, broken book decompositions, that I will explain in the next slide, generalize finite energy formations that were built by Hoffer, Wysocki, and Sinder only on the tight tree sphere. So if you understand the word tight doesn't matter, only on the tree sphere in 2003. Both theorems, I mean, theorem two and theorem three, use embedded contact homology. It was mentioned by Dusa yesterday um, in a very strong way. And embedded contact homology was mainly developed by Michael Hutchings, but not only. Okay. I won't say anything, anything more about embedded contact homology unless someone wants to know. Okay. So let me now tell you what a broken decomposition is. So a broken decomposition is, a broken book decomposition is a generalization of an open book decomposition. So you want also a link, okay? And now you want the foliation of the complement that it won't be trivial as in the open book case, but it's not a very ugly foliation either. So it's a two-dimensional foliation whose leaves are properly embedded. And so these are surfaces with boundary and the boundary is contained in K, okay? And we allow two different things to happen along a boundary component. So about, along the binding, along the K. So along one, circle and binding, you can consider tubular neighborhood. And you remember this picture I put when I was talking about open books, so you have this radial foliation coming in. So you have the picture on your left, if you cut it transversely, you will see the foliation that is just radial lines, okay? This is the radial components of the binding, it's exactly the same as in the open book case, okay? And now we add another type of possible binding is the broken part of the binding that is us in the right hand side picture, where you will have four sectors that are foliated by hyperbolas. I call them hyperbolas just by, I mean, the leaves don't locally don't touch 
the center point that corresponds to the to the binding component. And two sectors are separated by a part that is radially foliated, foliated, sorry. This radially foliated part can be just one leaf, but it's at least one leaf, and maybe it's more. Okay, we don't have any control on what these parts look like. Okay. Um, yes. No, so there's just four sectors. I mean, in this case, in the right hand case, there's four sectors by hyperbolas and four, four sectors radially. Yeah, but I have confused with this. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, so it's, it's, it's all, I mean, in our case, all the construction is just this. I mean, a priori one could have broken books with many sectors, but the ones I will use that will have this property that just have four sectors. Is that fine? So you will prove that with this configuration, your your broken open book decomposition is open and dense. I mean, the, the set of web flows admitting. No. So what I what what we prove is two things. So what we prove is uh, first that if you give me a non-degenerate web vector fill, it's supported by one of these things. So that's, I, I need to say what support it means. And then I will tell you how to destroy the broken parts. Okay? That's that's what follows. Okay. So, and do, do, do the colored arrows, do they indicate the transverse orientation of the foliation? No. The, what no. they indicate is that, the, so, so let me, let me, I will say it in a minute. If you give me one minute. So, so a vector fill is supported by a broken book decomposition if it's tangent to the binding and transfer to the interior of the leaves of the foliage. When you have a vector fill that is supported by a broken book decomposition like this, if it's non-degenerate, so the periodic orbits in the binding are either elliptic or hyperbolic. And what happens is that the periodic orbits that will be in the broken part of the binding, so this, as in the picture above, this is a 3D picture of the broken part of the binding, have to be hyperbolic. And so this blue and red arrows that were in the picture in the, in the previous slide and in this one are the stable and unstable manifolds of this hyperbolic periodic orbits. Did I answer the question? Uh, yes, thank you. Okay. So, so in for the for the radial ones, you can have either a, an elliptic or a hyperbolic periodic orbit, but for the broken parts, you know they are hyperbolic. Okay. So the monodromy. So you can look at the monodromy along these broken parts these broken components of the binding, the monodromy of the foliation, and then you either have the identity or you have half a turn. And the difference between the two is if the periodic orbit is positive hyperbolic, you get the identity. And if it's negative hyperbolic, you get half a turn. Okay? And if you don't have any broken components in the binding, your broken book decomposition is an open book decomposition. Okay, so let me go back. So we want to prove that generally a rub vector field admits a bare top section. It's equivalent to saying that it's supported by an open book decomposition. And what I told you now is that generically, because just I just put this non-degenerate hypothesis on the on the rub vector field, and this is a infinity generic hypothesis, it is supported by a broken book. So now we want to go from broken books to open books. And so we want to get rid of the broken components of the binding. Okay. Now let me, before continuing with the proof, let me put you a picture of a broken book, an easy broken book. And for that, before I put the picture, I want you to go back a little bit in my talk and think about the Hopf vibration. 
So I told you any fiber is the boundary of Birkhoff section that is a disk. So what I'm saying is that you can have a, a, a non knot on S3, and then the rest of it will fiber over, over S1, and the fibers will be just uh, disks. So we'll build a broken book that is not very different from that. It's, I think, the simplest broken book that one can think of. I don't know. So this is a picture. So this is not a nice picture. It was not done by Pierre, but by myself. Um, and let me try to explain it. So you're on S3, and you suppose that you have three parallel periodic orbits. So you can think them on a cylinder. The cylinder is given by these two vertical lines. And each periodic orbit is represented by two points. So this point, the periodic orbit comes from the black dot here on the top. It comes out of the screen and then backwards in through the other black dot. And then it does half a turn behind the screen. The same for the two squares. They represent one periodic orbit. And the same for the empty dots here. They represent the third periodic orbit. I have just one broken component. It's a square. And what I put in red is the stable and unstable directions, I mean, transversely, of this, of this, of this periodic orbit. And then you have two radial components are the, the dotted periodic orbits, okay? Here, so between these two, you have these two uh, leaves of the foliation. There are cylinders because this turns and goes to here and then backwards in here. And the same with that, with that. Here you have another cylinder vertical and then horizontally you have two uh, discs, one over here and the other over here, okay? If you see the bright green, are what we call the rigid leaves. So if you take the complement of the rigid leaves in a broken book decomposition, um, the rest you get, in this case, you get three connected components and each connected component fibers over R and the fibration gives you the foliation, okay? So these rigid leaves give a finite collection of surfaces that intersect all the orbits, okay, and have boundaries. And somehow they, they have to code the dynamics, even if no one has explored this, but, you know, an, an orbit gets into here and then it will follow the vibration and get out. And it will get out from this connected components through another rigid lip. So you have a map from one rigid lip to another. The only problem being that you have this stable and unstable manifold. So the orbit I pick might be on the stable manifold and end up here and don't touch any more rigid lips. But one should be able to explore this. Um, so this is one broken book decomposition. And what you want to get rid of them is of this broken part of the binding. Okay. So I will finish quickly because I think the time is going out. So how you get rid of the broken part of the binding. And here is an ideal situation that I don't know if it exists, but let me do an ability an ideal situation first. So let R be the union of the rigid lips and forget about the rest of the broken book. We just want the rigid lips. Okay? And I want to transform these rigid lips into a beer cup section. Suppose that by some miracle you have a transverse surface, so a surface with boundary whose interior is transverse to the vector field and whose boundary is made of periodic orbits, and that these periodic orbits that I call K prime, the collection, is disjoint from KB, from the broken part. And you assume also that the interior of the surface intersects every component of KB. And then you do the Fritz sum of S with the rigid lips. And what you get is a Birkhoff section. 
And what happens, what you have to understand is what happens near a broken part of the binding. And here what I put is, so this is an exploded broken part of the binding. Here you see the stable manifold and the unstable manifold in dotted lines, blue, blue and red. And then in the middle, these are some rigid limbs. Then we assume that they are there. There are finitely many rigid limbs, so not, not too many things. And then in yellow orange here, you have the surface S that comes transverse to the thing. And so when you blow up, it gives you a circle transverse to this. And then you undo the intersections, as free does, and you get to this. And you have to rearrange it a little bit so that when you blow down, you get a section again. But what you can see is two things can happen. Either this particular component of KB disappears from the binding, either it becomes a radial thing because the, the curve that you get at the end from here will go around this blown up periodic orbit. Obviously, this is an ideal situation. Looking for a surface like this is quite impossible, but you can do a little bit better. So let me just go a little bit more general. You can, if you find a surface that is not longer transverse to all the vector field, but just positively transverse to the binding orbits that you want to destroy, and whose boundary is joint from KB, then you can take like n times the rigid lifts for a big, big n plus s, and that will be transverse to the vector form. And the way to think about this is not as surfaces, but as Poincare duals of the surface. So what you want to find is a, one a homology class that will be positive on the vector field outside of the binding orbits and um, and will link positively with all the measures. So this, since R, the dual of R is positive on the vector field, then if you take a big N, it doesn't matter what you have here, you, you will get something that is positive. And this is just for people that know more. So, so actually what you want here is you don't care about the surface. What you want is this collection of periodic orbits that links positively with every broken component of the binding. And then at least if you're in a homology sphere, you will get the surface you want. Now, if you are not in a homology sphere, you have to work much more. And this is where Iris results comes in because the broken parts of binding um, they link positively with the volume and since the volume can be approximated by measures that are supported on periodic orbits it means that at some point you get a big big collection of periodic orbits that has to link positive with the broken binding of your broken book and this allows to get rid of the book. Right. And I will stop here. Thank you very much. So thank you very much for your very nice talk. Are there any questions? Yes. Uh, so when you apply Iwie's, uh, so you, you should pronounce Iwie. Iwie. Okay. Yeah, that's, that's Thank fine. you. So, <laughs> uh, do you need, don't you need uh, non-degeneracy for the closed orbit, periodic orbit? No, you don't no? need it. You don't need it. Um, no, you don't need it. You don't need it anymore. The only place where we use a non-degeneracy is to build a broken book. Mm -hmm. And actually, to build a broken book, you don't even need that all the periodic orbits are non-degenerate. You just need that sufficiently, I mean, that long periodic orbits, you don't care. You just need the short, for some short uh, periodic orbits.